This is a science channel, so let's talk about Atlantis. <laughs> Just kidding. Atlantis is many things: allegorical, propaganda, orientalist, utopian, occult. But real is not one of them. Yep, that's it. That's the video. Okay, that was an easy video. Just have to upload it real quick. I, I wonder what the thumbnail for this one is. Maybe I was being rash. The surface of our planet is an ever-changing place, where what was once the perfect setting for an ecosystem can be washed away through the ages. There have absolutely been times in Earth's history when ancient lands, vibrant with diverse life, have been swallowed up by the sea. Some of them were even inhabited by prehistoric man. I mean, don't go into this video expecting evidence for whatever is happening here. Or some evidence for the kingdom or island of Atlantis. That's all totally made up. But the actual reality of life on these lost lands is just as fascinating. While watching this video, you will notice a similar pattern of when all of these land masses appeared and disappeared. Every example today of lost places will come from the Pleistocene epoch, which ended a mere 11,700 years ago. The only great example I could find of a lost landmass from earlier was the southern continent of Zealandia, but I've already covered the last remnants of this ancient continent's ecosystem in my video about New Caledonia. There's a good reason there's plenty more examples from the Pleistocene. The Pleistocene is probably more famously known as the Ice Age, and it is this ice that will be the catalyst, but eventual demise for the subjects of our video. You see, as the Earth cooled down, an immense magnitude of water froze, being confined to humongous glaciers around the Earth's poles and mountain ranges. All of the water has to come from somewhere, so during glacial periods, sea levels dropped pretty significantly, which turned parts of the ocean floor into dry land. It's pretty obvious when looking at a map of the Pleistocene how much landier it is than modern Earth. And maybe the most well-known example of an extra bit of land during the Ice Age was this bit in the corner. Or is it this corner? Hmm. This is Beringia, the land bridge that, for times, connected the old world with the new. Now submerged under the Bering Sea, aha, <laughs> get it. The land bridge was not some kind of animal interstate, but its own ecosystem. It was, in fact, a piece of dry land. Which goes against a general misconception I've heard about Beringia being a big bridge of ice. I bring this up mainly because I thought this when I was younger, and assume others assume it too. I can't be that dumb. Besides, it would make perfect sense. I was told glaciers covered most of the northern contiguous U.S. How would they not be caked on Alaska of all places? Well, glaciers don't just magically form based on latitude and proximity to the poles. Lots of things go into glaciation, like elevation and the moisture of the air. Mountain valleys with concentrations of moisture formed tolerable locations for glaciers, but the super dry air of the other Beringian regions made it impossible for glaciers to build up. It was on this habitable land that allowed Asia and North America to exchange animal life, from camels going to Asia, where they are exclusively found wild now, to elephantids and bison making their way to the states. During the last glacial maximum, however, this land bridge closed on the American side due to the encroachment of ice sheets to the east. But even during this glacial maximum, Beringia wasn't just a bleak tundra, but at least part of it was a thriving ecosystem. There was diversity in its landscape. In damper lowlands, sedge and moss dominated mires, and there is evidence for pockets of boreal trees and shrubs on the landmass as well. But chunks of Beringia, along with vast swaths of Eurasia and North America during the glacial periods, formed the Mammoth Steppe, a dry but biologically rich ocean of grasslands, nothing like today's far north. With so little precipitation in the air, any land not under ice was baked with sunny skies, the perfect place for the C4 grasses, whose photosynthesis process requires tons of sun and little rain. So opposed to the overcast, wet tundras of today, Beringia was a cloudless, vast meadow, home to various grass species like blue and wild rye grass. For all you plant heads out there, some of the other flora on the steppe would consist of sages, mustard, poppies, buttercup, and various other forbs. Such an array of productive plants were also host to various grazing animals. The residents of the mammoth steppe include wild horses. Step bison, and to absolutely no surprise, 
the woolly mammoth. Rubbing shoulders with these prehistoric beasts would be herbivores still prevalent in the north, like muskox, caribou, and saiga antelope. Hunting them was the cave lion, the largest and most abundant cat of Beringia. It did not physically differ too much from modern lions, with the exception of being noticeably larger and completely lacking a mane. You are probably wondering how us humans know the hair distribution on an extinct animal. If usually all we have is skeletons, well, it's because we were informed of this information by us. Yes, from cave paintings of the very earliest animal experts, we have considerable evidence these lions were maneless. Examples like this are why Pleistocene paleontology is just so awesome. Along with the cave lion was Arctotus, the massive short-faced bear which could reach 800 kilograms in weight and tower over any modern bear at 4 meters tall on its back legs. Once more, modern fauna is scattered among these Pleistocene relics. Gray wolves were another abundant predator of the Beringian steppe, differing only slightly from modern gray wolves by a shorter, broader skull, useful in delivering bites to large prey, or their carcasses. Maybe the most deadly predator of our time, the human, was also found on the steppe, and they weren't just passing by as well. A theory states that after humans arrived in Beringia, they became genetically isolated from their source of Northeast Asia about 30,000 years ago at the apex of the ice sheet's extent. They remained there until the end of this glacial maximum 15,000 years ago. So, for around 15,000 years, a group of humans known as the Standstill Population existed on Beringia separated from any other population, before spreading back into Asia and America, possibly becoming the first humans to reach the New World. Beringia was much more than just a land bridge. It was an ecosystem that rivaled the African savanna, while being 6,000 kilometers further north. Of course, Beringia and its life would come to an end. What led to the extinction of life that lived on the mammoth steppe is a hotly debated topic, with arguments between whether climate change or human-led extinctions are at most fault. This extends to the steppe of Beringia, but regardless of what caused the animal's extinction, Clearly, climate got the last laugh. As the glaciers melted, Beringia would be submerged by ocean. The only herds of large animals left would be the walrus on the bleak coast of the Bering Sea. Going to the other side of the Mammoth Steppe brings us to our next example. In 1931, off the eastern coast of England, a fishing boat sprang up, fish, presumably, and an antler point, sharpened into the barb of a tool. This intensified archaeological study into an earlier discovered slice of land that sat under the northern sea, Dogger Land, consisting of a stream-crossed lowland that was shielded to its north by modest hills. Dogger Land changed greatly as time progressed, representing various different ecosystems ever since Europe slashed glacial peak. Starting with the slow warming of temperature that decreased glacial cover 16,000 years ago, Dogger Land would have been desolate looking similar to arctic ecosystems of today, populated by arctic lemmings, hares, and even polar bears. But sadly enough, no dogs. Starting 13,000 years ago, Europe would warm up considerably, leading to a much nicer Doggerland. It was no mammoth steppe, however. Instead, Doggerland was probably covered by a light forest composed of birch, juniper, willow, and pine trees, interspersed with patches of wetland. The wildlife present is still some of the most iconic in the Pleistocene. We know from neighboring fossils in England and Northwest Europe that horse, deer, reindeer, elk, saigas, bison, and aurochs, the large ancestors of domestic cattle, would have roamed Doggerland at this time. For our woolly category, both the woolly mammoth and woolly rhinoceros may have survived, but were certainly on the decline as the Ice Age came to a close. Maybe the most striking herbivore of Doggerland would have been Megaloceros, the Irish elk. Males could grow to the size of a large moose, but with antlers that spanned four meters across, roughly two shacks in length. Preying on these would have been the wolf, bear, cave lion, and cave hyena. Yep, just like cave lions, hyenas were not restricted to warm Africa, and wandered the Eurasian continent, built for cracking the bones of large herbivore remains. By this point in Doggerland, do we find the possibility of us inhabiting this place, setting up camps and hunting the local game. For a span during the Younger Dryas, a millennia-long hiccup of severely cold times, Doggerland might have been covered in tundra, only populated by reindeer and muskox. 
But by the earliest Holocene around 10,000 years ago, the forests and wetlands had returned, along with the wildlife, minus the outstanding fauna exclusive to the Pleistocene, like the mammoths, rhinos, and Irish elk. The lions and hyenas who hunted them were gone too, but the opportunistic brown bear remained. Human populations still survived, crafting tools and even by this time domesticating canines. Yes, we did in fact bring dogs into Doggerland, but this fertile land could not be here forever. As the Holocene progressed and the glaciers melted, Doggerland would be encroached on by water. At first its soils were bogged down by freshwater swamps, then by brackish tides until most of the land had sunk under the waves of the North Sea. Doggerland became an island, then a bleak archipelago surrounded by shallow sea. Whatever human inhabitants that could have lived there would have eventually faced a grim but slow demise as the water steadily lapped their land up. But that is not what may have happened. Off the coast of Norway, an event known as the Storega Slide occurred a huge underwater landslide that displaced 3,500 cubic kilometers of material. That ensuing tsunami would have headed southwards with the remnants of Doggerland right in its crosshairs. It is unknown the full impact of the tsunami, but even if it did not completely submerge the Dogger Islands, it would have catastrophically affected the coastal terrain and any communities that still persisted. So just like the ancient myth of Atlantis, Doggerland would go out with a bang, struck by the wrath of nature before continuing its demise into the ocean. Moving southward, far away from the conventional habitat of the Pleistocene, we can find ourselves in the steaming jungles of Indonesia. Even in the distant times of the last glacial maximums, rainforest still would have populated the major islands of the Indonesian archipelago, including Borneo, Java, and Sumatra. It is only in the space between these islands where things were significantly different from the present. As we can expect by now, what was once the shallow ocean between these islands became dry land when the sea lowered by 50 meters or more. This large peninsula is known as Sundaland, and with its proximity from the equator, it was much warmer than the other lands we have talked about so far and therefore the life we will observe share far less in common with the classic mammoth steppe ecosystem we've grown accompanied to. The lowlands of Sundaland would have been dry enough to support a savanna-like ecosystem, a corridor that ran through the center of the landmass. The now islands of Indonesia were of a similar habitat in the earlier Pleistocene, populated by animals which preferred this terrain, but as old as 120,000 years ago, a faunal turnover occurred. It appears the ecosystem became much more humid on these elevated chunks of land, and the earlier fauna was succeeded by populations of familiar faces from mainland Asia. However, all things considered, I don't believe it's impossible to assume these earlier beasts predisposed to open land would have survived on the savanna, even as they were replaced by jungle life in the uplands. Under this assumption, the savanna would have been home to grazers like the stegodon. Stegodons fall outside the taxonomic family of elephants and mammoths, and even by the later Pleistocene were from a more ancient lineage of proboscideans. Superficially similar to modern Asian elephants, the most distinct trait of a stegodon would have been its long, gradually curving tusks. Grazing alongside them would have been an apparent rival of the Irish elk for the most needlessly long headgear. This species of water buffalo would have supported horns 2.5 meters from tip to tip, a meager 1.15 shacks in length. Another larger herbivore possibly inhabiting this land was an Asian species of hippopotamus, who as well were grazers. Hunting them was a fearsome tiger species, whose bones were dug up on the island of Borneo, a place no such tiger is found today. If you were to hike up to the jungles of the higher elevations, you would find the modern animals that replaced those of the open savanna. Succeeding the stegodon would be the modern Asian elephant, and instead of sturdy-legged grazers, you would find tree dwellers like orangutans, gibbons, and the sun bear, as well as forest-dwelling herbivores in the tapir and Sumatran rhinoceros. Included among these travelers from mainland Asia are modern man, who replaced the smaller, earlier species of human, Homo erectus. Spoiler alert, but Sundaland drowned, the remaining savanna creatures who may have lived in the low-lying areas of the landmass were now without doubt wiped out when their ecosystem disappeared underneath the tide. 
but unlike the other two landmasses, a large chunk of Sunderland still remains above water, that rainforested hill country of the Pleistocene, now the islands of Indonesia. On these islands, the survivors of Sunderland's demise persist, even the very first humans of Sunderland. Although other ethnicities have moved into Indonesia, these first Sundaland people are still found in pockets on the Malay Peninsula and Philippine Islands. Into modern time, these true antediluvians were hunter-gatherers, a lifestyle they had remained true to ever since they first inhabited these same lands tens and tens of thousands of years ago. There is no concrete proof save for indigenous rumor that a Bornean tiger survived to the present day, Still, its distant living relative, the Sumatran tiger, has for certain survived into the modern day on the island of Sumatra. This tiger, unlike the other big cats of Doggerland and Beringia, still stalks its ancient land, the last of the feline nobility that ruled the antediluvian world. At least partially, the inhabitants of the real Atlantises of our time continue to endure. Man, oh man, this was a fun video to research. I could have added much more, but alas, time restricts me. I truly love the Pleistocene, and maybe in the future we'll focus more of my time on it. If you liked this video, you'll also probably like my video, The Fantastic World of Other Human Species, which also uses the same music by Questmaster. Anyways, thanks to the wonderful images and videos I used to make this. Thanks for watching. See ya.